So without further ado, I would like to hand over to your host for this first session, Naeem Merchant, who is from Carbon Removal Canada, but you may recognize his dulcet tones from the Carbon Curve podcast as well. Naeem, the stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. My name is Naeem Merchant. Uh, I'm the Executive Director of Carbon Removal Canada, and I'm excited to be moderating this panel on setting up the right policy framework for scaling up CDR. Um, and that's because I believe that designing you know, well-designed policies are absolutely critical uh, to growing the CDR industry in a rapid and responsible way. Uh, now, I'm a little biased. Uh, I'm starting a, a carbon removal policy initiative called Carbon Removal Canada. So think Carbon 180, but within the Canadian ecosystem. Uh, but I'm really excited to get a chance today to learn from some of the foremost experts on carbon removal policy in the world. And so I'd like to introduce them uh, and have them come up on stage. It's uh, Noah Deich from the Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management at the US Department of Energy, Gianna Amador, Executive Director of the Carbon Removal Alliance, Helen Brave, VP of Climate Policy at Puro, and Eva Tame from uh, Climate Principles. Thank you all for, for joining us today. All right, okay, so let's start with the U.S. policy landscape um, with, with you, Noah. Um, can you give us you know, a high-level summary of what your office at the Department of Energy uh, does and maybe some of the recent carbon removal policy wins that we've seen in the U.S. lately? Yeah, happy to. And first, congrats to the, the Climeworks team. Amazing turnout. Great to see how much you, you've grown over the past uh, few years. And I, th I think where I'll start is the U.S. has comprehensive and ambitious climate policy for the first time ever, which is amazing. What's even more amazing is that carbon management, and specifically direct air capture, is a key component of that. Small, but absolutely significant, and I think relatively incredibly important. And what that means is that the U.S. is now doing the three things that the direct air capture and the broader carbon removal field needs today, which is one, support innovation from science to tech to pilot to demonstration to actual commercial early of a kind projects, mm -hmm. supporting incentives, both through tax credits and soon a purchasing program. And then three, figuring out the standards, the measurement, the verification, everything that we're gonna need to scale this into the future in, in carbon markets. And so it's a really exciting time in the US because we're working on all three of those elements and recognize that we need to not just pioneer that in the US, but figure out how to help other governments around the world work on all three of those buckets, because we need this to be global to succeed, and we need all three of those pillars if we're actually gonna make the progress we need and hit some of the 2030 interim targets that are gonna get us to that 2050 goal of, of net zero and beyond that we need. And it's great to hear that there's uh, a focus on helping other countries um, kind of achieve some of the same policy wins or, or different policy wins that are supportive of carbon removal around the world. But more generally, you know, what makes public sector support for some of these kind of demonstration projects around direct air capture and other carbon removal methods, what makes that so important? So what makes it so important is that these projects are expensive today compared to voluntary markets. And uh, there's a whole bunch of things that governments need to do, both to make those projects less expensive and make them more investable. And so I think that's where the combination of subsidies, grants, and broader certainty about the framework that the US policy world provides now is essential. Because without that, we have seen a lack of projects to date and the amount of interest that we're seeing across the U.S. carbon management ecosystem is really night and day compared to two years ago when the policy framework was much less evolved on those dimensions. Right. And, and maybe to shift over to Gianna um, in kind of thinking about the U.S. policy context a little bit, can you give us some background on the Carbon Removal Alliance as a kind of new entrance to the CDR policy space? 
Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate the opportunity. So the Carbon Removal Alliance is a new organization. Our goal is to unite the carbon removal private sector in um, and in particular, the innovators who are building the new carbon removal industry. Um, so our goal is to sort of align interests across this very diverse field and to champion high quality carbon removal. And for us, that means carbon removal that is additional, verifiable, net negative, permanent, and also minimizes harms to communities while also maximizing co-benefits for the communities where these projects are located. So I really see our real value in sort of two places. I think one, servicing the challenges that entrepreneurs are facing when they're trying to commercialize these technologies and feeding that directly into US federal policy. And then I think two, really harnessing the power that the private sector has to be able to advocate for the development of this field to hopefully, to be able to move faster um, and to move better to support these technologies is coming to scale. Yeah. Yeah, and on that point around the need to move faster, you know, and 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 going back to some of the kind of policy achievements that that Noah was talking about earlier, how should we be thinking about or designing policies going forward building off of the successes that we've seen so far? Yeah. Um, I think the first thing we can do is is do more. Um, I think we are really I'm really impressed and thankful for the amount of policy progress that we've had so far, particularly in the United States, and I think we're already starting to see those investments pay dividends, but ultimately in the scale of technology development, the amounts of funding that we've invested so far are relatively small, and so I think we need to um, grow the pie for carbon removal and, of course, for climate technologies more generally. I would say, too, a lot of the policy incentives that we see today in the US are very focused on direct air capture. And so I think there's an opportunity to expand carbon removal policies to focus on a full portfolio of permanent carbon removal technologies from enhanced rock weathering to ocean-based approaches um, to bikers' approaches. And I think in order to do that at the Carbon Removal Alliance, I think we believe that technology-neutral policy that's really principles approach, um, or really principles-based, is an approach that um, will allow us to really drive innovation across the whole technology portfolio and allow us to solve for the outcomes that we want instead of sort of predetermining what technologies are going to be winners. And I think that's really important because even five years ago, I think we couldn't have imagined the types of companies that um, are in the carbon removal space today. So we want to make sure that policy is really resilient and can grow with the field as opposed to being kind of cornered by it. Yeah, and so kind of acknowledging that we need this technology neutral approach, but recognizing that there are policy specific um, approaches to supporting these different methods, but yeah. making sure we're looking at the whole field. That makes a lot of sense. I know, and, and in re regards to kind of thinking about how different carbon removal methods face different challenges, one thing that comes to mind for me is measurement reporting and verification, MRV. How do we ensure that we are implementing high quality MRV in the kind of policy framework that you just described? Yeah. There, there's two things that I think about. One, I think we need markets, both public and private sector, to demand high quality MRV. Um, I think that really is what ultimately is going to drive investments in this space. And I think, two, we need science to be able to provide the information to govern both this, you know, the standards, the protocols, and the technologies in which we're actually using to implement monitoring, reporting, and verification in a market. I think there's a role for the government to play in setting those standards that allow us to compare carbon removal technologies across these different sectors, despite their differences, and to set a standard of what high quality carbon removal looks like in a way that I think will have ripple effects in both voluntary and compliance markets. And I think the last thing I would add is that I think there's a role for government um, to play in investing in hard technology and collaboration to help solve some of the MRV challenges, particularly around things that are a little bit tough, like open systems. And we've seen the Department of Energy with the things like their MRV lab call um, starting to make some of those initial investments. That's really, that's great. And, and so before we kind of shift gears to thinking about the kind of European context, uh, Noah, I've got to ask, you know, how do we keep the policy momentum going in the United States? Uh, what, does that, what does that look like? So I think two things. First, build projects. Still too conceptual today. I love the models in the back, but we need actual projects at that scale yeah. to show the world what those projects look like. The second is to make sure that those projects don't just work from a technical or a business model standpoint, but engage communities and provide robust environmental protection so that people want carbon removal in their community. Right. 
And that's a big challenge, not just in the carbon management space, but across all of the infrastructure build out that we're gonna need for a net zero future. It's tough to build stuff. And so we need to change that broader headwind. And when it comes to these projects, make sure that the communities, the workforces, the broader environment in that local region sees these projects as a boon for them not just for a global climate challenge that we're trying to solve. Right. Yeah, and that community engagement piece is, is really, really important and just generally kind of that public acceptance. Um, and we'll, we'll get to that uh, a bit later on. Um, so I'm excited to dig into that um, in a few minutes, but let's, let's shift over to Europe. Um, Helen, can you give us you know, a broad overview of the major policy efforts that are underway and you know, what is needed to enable investment? in durable carbon removal like direct air capture. Yeah, and first of all, thank you. Thank you to Climeworks and for bringing us together here as a community once a year, but also for what you do throughout the year and your latest publication calling for the clear distinction of emission reductions versus emissions removals targets is really called for and it should be restated that this is not about preserving business as usual. So thank you very much, Climeworks. If I may, I'm just a short moment on, on Puro Earth and what we do. We have a carbon crediting program. Um, we've certified durable carbon removal since 2019. We now have around 40 suppliers. And through the Puro standard, we create science-based robust methodologies for issuing carbon removal credits, what we call corks. We have an independent advisory body which approves all these methodologies and all projects are independently verified. We also run the registry which publishes all the issuances and retirements. This builds transparency in carbon markets and progressive players such as Microsoft, Boston Consulting Group, JP Morgan, Shopify, Zurich Insurance, Klarna and also demand aggregators such as NextGen and uh, Frontier have purchased or pre-purchased corks. So we see that high quality certification is essential. Buyers need to know what they're buying and suppliers need to be able to build trust. And if I may, yes, building on what Noah was saying, it sounds like we've written the same notes. Just first of all, four points on what we need, four pillars you need for an investable policy framework. First of all, you need national plans with this clear separate the targets for removals and reductions. We also need robust certification and building on what the Integrity Council for the Voluntary Carbon Market has stated. It needs to have effective governance, it needs to have robust quantification, and it needs to make sure it has environmental and social safeguards. The third pillar is all around policy measures, and we can unpack that a bit more, but we need to have the business case for investment, and that can take a range of measures. We've heard about procurement, we've heard about tax credits, low-cost loans, innovation funding, but also looking at compliance markets, there'll often be more than one policy measure to make that business case. And then finally, the fourth pillar, which probably overlaps with the other three, but is really important to emphasize, is the use case. We need clear clarity on how these corks, these carbon removal credits can be used. And we welcome more clarity from the Voluntary Carbon Markets Integrity Initiative, as well as the Science-Based Targets Initiative, and from policymakers on the use case for durable carbon removal. We're certifying, as Gianna already mentioned, you know, enhanced rock weathering, bioenergy carbon capture, direct air carbon capture and storage, biochar, this range of durable carbon removals. Thanks. Great. And, and Eva, I, I'd love to get into maybe some specific examples um, around the EU policy frameworks. Uh, let's start with the EU carbon removal certification framework. What is it and what is it aiming to do and how do we kind of incorporate removals into that entire process? Thank you and uh, it's great to be here today. Um, so getting into the specific policy framework now, uh, the carbon removal certification framework uh, was proposed uh, last November and uh, we are discussing it here in the context of voluntary markets because one of its possible use cases is a voluntary market. And uh, it's essentially a quantification tool, if we put it very broadly. And um, it fills a specific gap that we have in Europe in climate policy because we just don't yet have a way of quantifying 
quality carbon removals in Europe at the moment, and the current climate targets don't include those removals. So to be able to do that in the future, we need to be able to start the, the, the quantification. So uh, this specific piece of legislation, which is still a proposal, so it's going to be discussed now over the next year and hopefully we'll get it adopted in the first quarter of 2024, divides removals into three types. We have permanent carbon removal, we have carbon farming, and we have carbon uh, storage in products. And the way this system is supposed to be governed is uh, where it's, it's centrally kind of managed by the commission that will establish the methodologies. So it means that it will not uh, have any rubber stamping of existing methodologies, methodologies that exist in the voluntary markets, but instead it will definitely learn from what is already out there, but then build specific EU methodologies for, for carbon removal. And it will rely in its work also in the Carbon Removal Expert Group, where I'm, I'm one of the experts uh, who will then advise the Commission on, on the methodologies to, to adopt. And oftentimes there are questions, okay, the proposal is out, um, what's wrong in there? Like, what, what could be changed? And the usual two aspects that come up uh, tend to be the definitions, the fact that removals there are defined partly also as emission reductions when it comes to carbon, uh, carbon farming. And in this case, I think many stakeholders are pushing for clarity and, and using the standard IPCC definitions. The second part is use. Helen mentioned we need this clarity, how voluntary market credits actually could be used. Um, in this case, it's even more complex because some of these activities are supposed to contribute to EU's climate targets, so some would go beyond. So we need more clarity on that. But I think the biggest question is what comes next? Um, because it's, it's clear for now that uh, uh, this aims for use cases like the voluntary market, but Post-2030, it's becoming quite obvious removals will be part of the EU climate targets more broadly, broadly, also novel ones, and part of the compliance markets. And this is kind of an intermediary step between like now and then, and we need a better understanding how that will change over time. Yeah. But it sounds like an absolutely essential component to successfully building carbon removal in a way that meets our kind of scale targets as well as doing so in this kind of responsible way. So it could have a lot of impact, but it sounds like there's some current areas where it, it's maybe falling a little bit short and, and could, could use some, some additional support. Is that right? Yeah, and I think one aspect that is relevant specifically for this audience where we don't have clarity is we need to make sure that where, however the certificates are going to be used, uh, that only permanent carbon removal will be used to balance fossil emissions. And currently, that kind of clarity doesn't exist in this piece of proposal. It also doesn't ex exist in other pieces of legislation that have been proposed where we were hinted in the past that those will solve it, but we really yet don't have the solution. So we, and we need that solution. Okay, so some, some real work to be done yeah. on, on what is otherwise a, a very, very exciting initiative that the EU is spearheading. Um, Helen, are there any other policy initiatives in Europe that we should really be focused on? Um, yeah, it's difficult to choose, actually. It's a super exciting time. And we just heard on the previous panel about the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, which is also super exciting. But I think the setting of EU's 2040 climate target is a key moment. And there, we, as a community, we can really carve out the space for what Europe calls uh, industrial carbon removal and a little pitch here. The open public consultation is open until the 24th of June. I'm also pretty excited about the EU Green Claims Directive. Again, that's sort of shining the light on carbon credits and the different types of carbon credits. It might be fun to do some strengthening under that uh, proposal, which is being politically negotiated. And I think also for, for direct air capture into geological storage, the EU's Net Zero Industry Act, which has CCS, hopefully, as a key industry, is a, a big backbone for the direct air capture community. I think, you know, um, that's just some examples. There'll be more um, that we can talk about. But what we need to focus on is looking at that business case and how all these policies fit together. Um, and we look forward to, to that discussion. And then looking outside of the European Union, 
really exciting sort of emerging discussion in Norway. There they're looking at you know, the carbon tax, which is around 200 euros per ton, and could, you know, bioenergy carbon capture and storage and direct air cap cap capture and storage feature under there as a sort of reverse carbon tax. And we know that the UK government will be issuing a um, response to their emissions trading system consultation, the business models and more information on certification. It's going back to the pillars we've been talking about. All these governments are moving forward. It's a, it's a super exciting time. No, it, it absolutely is a, a really exciting time. And, and one kind of other initiative that, that kind of comes to mind for me, um, you know, is, is Article 6. And I was hoping, Eva, you could talk us through a little bit about, you know, what is Article 6? Why is it important for carbon removal? Uh, and how can, how can stakeholders in the audience and, uh, and those who are listening kind of get involved in helping shape some of these frameworks around carbon removal? Yeah, happy to. So Article 6 is Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, just putting that out there to make it clear. And uh, within this article, we have, let's say, two mechanisms for carbon markets under the Paris Agreement. And the end goal of this article is not just to help countries achieve climate targets if they choose to use markets for it, and they can, that's a voluntary thing, they can you choose to use it or not. It's actually uh, meant to go beyond it to increase the ambition of countries under the Paris Agreement. And uh, so there are two mechanisms, and sadly we don't have names for them, so we have the 6.2 and 6.4, so bear with me. I would say 6.2 is a more flexible system, um, if you want to keep it in your mind with some kind of a, a word, where countries can collaborate in different ways. They can link their emissions trading system, they can uh, trade uh, carbon credits from carbon creating systems. Um, there are multiple ways they can do it bilaterally, multilaterally, it's, it's quite flexible. And it's already operational today, uh, Switzerland, for example, is one of the countries who have been trailblazing in the space, and um, yeah, a lot of, of progress and interesting things happening there. And then the second mechanism is an Article 6.4 mechanism, which is a centralized carbon creating system that will be built similar to those who have followed carbon markets before when we had Kyoto Protocol, we had clean development mechanism. Um, this is not like clean development me mechanism exactly, it's more like the other tool we had back then, which is the joint implementation. But basically, it's a centralized system that will then establish specific methodologies, including for carbon removal, that can be used under the system. But it's still being built, so we're not there yet. In the, in the governance system, they have a supervisory body for Article 6.4 mechanism that is currently preparing this general framework for how removals would be included under that me mechanism under the price agreement. So in your mind, you can think like we have the EU having the, the carbon removal certification mechanism, which is kind of a framework under which we'll have methodologies. And in, under Article 6.4, we also have this general framework being built right now, and then later on we'll have methodologies. But the thing is that this is currently not operational. Um, and I think what I, because recently there have been a lot of questions around Article 6.4 because of uh, some surprising documents or surprising content in documents that were published before the previous meeting uh, that were a bit biased on engineered removals. Um, what I wanted to say today is to kind of highlight that between these two mechanisms, it is quite obvious countries will lean towards using Article 6.2. This will be, I think, the bigger mechanism. It's easier to use. Uh, it's going to be cheaper to use. It's already operational. It's, it's kind of a no-brainer in this sense. And also, it's just it hasn't yet been used for, for removals. And voluntary market is going to feed into uh, also Article 6.4 to be operational, because some of the standards are already collaborating with the governments to make it happen. Now, the 6.4 is not yet happening. It will take, I think, quite some time to get it up and working. It's going to be more expensive to use, but it is so important to get it right, because if we establish systems under the Paris Agreement, uh, and we've, like, we've been through the same system under Kyoto Protocol, this is based on the consensus of close to 200 countries. So if, um, if we get this framework on removals wrong for some reason, 
then there is no way of really going back and changing it because this is a decision that has been adopted and everything else will be built um, upon it. So if you think back, we had some issues with the clean development mechanism under Kyoto Protocol. And well, we couldn't really fix it. And now we are kind of starting from scratch and then bringing in some like, better things from the CDM because we couldn't fix it. So we need to get it right. And that's why removals community will need to keep uh, paying attention to it. And also, this is going to be the global you know, mechanism where we have international methodologies for different carbon removal methods. We, we need to make sure it's, it's of high quality, it works well, that it's, it's going to be the gold standard. Yeah. So really important we get this right. And the risk is, is that we're not kind of paying enough attention to how this is how this is evolving, but there's a huge opportunity here for the, the, the carbon removal sector to, to, to help kind of shape what this looks like um, in a way that is supportive for, for carbon removal. Now, th thank you so much for breaking those. These, some of these, these systems and, and these mechanisms are pretty complex, so thank you for breaking it down for us in a way that is uh, a little more understandable for folks. But I'd like to kind of pivot back to something that I think is relevant uh, regardless of geography um, and you know, it looks different in every country, I think, but uh, it's a challenge that we're all going to face in, in, in those of us who are thinking about adopting kind of uh, policies that are supportive of carbon removal. Um, so we can get all the policy wins we want, but I, my view is, is that they're not going to get very far if we don't build public acceptance for carbon removal more broadly. And so I'm, I'm curious to know, what can we do to, you know, build that license to operate uh, for carbon removal projects? And how can we effectively respond to some of the concerns that are going to come up from policymakers, from different communities around carbon removal? I think that's going to be a really important thing that we're doing as we are trying to kind of shape supportive policies around, around CDR. And I'd love, I'd love to get everyone's take on this, and maybe starting with you, Gianna, around what, what your thoughts around this are. Yeah, I think it's a, a really important question, especially for the inflection point that the field's at. For me, you know, we've talked a lot about demonstration projects today sort of across the panels, and I think that is really sort of coming to light as we think about really this is the public's in, in many ways first like real touch point with carbon removal, and we've sort of reached a point in a field in which not all carbon removal is good carbon removal. So we have this really exciting opportunity to define what does high quality carbon removal look like? What do we want the future of carbon removal to look like? And how do we use some of these near term demonstration projects to highlight what that potential future could look like? And I think we need to tell that story in a lot of different ways. I think we need to tell the innovation story of where is the field now? What are our shortcomings? Where do we want to improve? And what does that trajectory look like? And be comfortable with the, the risk of, of failure. I think we need to tell another story about community benefits and environmental safeguards and community autonomy and decision making. I think we need to, to tell another story around monitoring, reporting, and verification and, and proving that these solutions are really credible as part of our climate commitment. Um, and I think the last story we need to tell is about that potential economic and jobs benefits that really come from these projects and actually begin to substantiate what that looks like on the ground for real people. So I think there's an exciting storytelling opportunity here that will build the public education and knowledge and comfort with these solutions if we do it right. Um, and we speak to sort of these different values across the sort of entire carbon removal or sort of more public space. Yeah. yeah and that makes me think about, you know, Noah's comment earlier about the need to see projects actually, you know, get deployed. Um, Noah, how do you think about this, this challenge around public acceptance and license to operate? So I think actually the Climeworks example is a great one. If you had said you could put direct air capture at a geothermal power plant and sequester it, okay, if you can show that, it completely changes the game. And we've seen that happen. You have to walk the walk. Right. And so what I worry about is the public acceptance conversation if we just go and talk about long term, Article 6, all that stuff is very important, but you never make progress on the public acceptance part until you build projects. And so what we need to do is pull the policy to the, the here and now, which is how do we fund demonstration projects around the world? And only by doing that will policymakers have the actual physical projects to say, this is what it is, here's how a community benefits, here's how we can protect 
communities from any unintended consequences. And only by making it real can we actually get to the place where we get to scale. And so I think that's the key challenge, is how do we get the world to build projects? And right now I see that happening in the US, but at a significant scale, it's not happening in the rest of the world nearly as fast as it needs to. Right. Yeah, and it seems like we have you know, a lot of catching up to do um, uh, you know, around that, but we can also design policies that support you know, the, the responsible deployment of, of carbon removal around the world and then showcase what that looks like in a way that is useful to, to policymakers regardless of, of where they are. Um, Helen, what would you add around you know, kind of thinking about this, maybe from a European context, on, on public acceptance issues and, and license to operate for carbon removal writ large? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to repeat all the good points that have been made by um, Gianna and Noah because that is, is really important. And I still think this 2040 discussion, the climate target in the EU, will, will be a, a license to operate moment. But I think maybe I reflect more on what can we do as a community and as, as carbon removers. I think in this discussion around the policies that we need, is we need to go to policymakers with, with evidence-based requests, but also with, with an open mindset. We're all learning. We've heard that today. Um, we all need to work towards you know, viable policy solutions, and they'll look very different depending on which jurisdiction we're operating in, and, that, and that's fine. So that would be my request from a kind of policy uh, person perspective. Thank you. And so getting back to the here and now of, of policy, have there anything to add on, on this issue? Yeah, it's always difficult to be the fourth one to comment on something, <laughs> but uh, lots of, of good things have been said. But I think uh, one aspect uh, that, in my view, is useful and, and I keep bringing it up every now and then in these conversations is uh, if we take a step back and don't think within the bubble of, of the carbon removals community, the reality is that we still need to do so, so much ca capacity building among policymakers because there are still those among them with whom the conversation is not about uh, how we do carbon removal, it's still about why we're doing it. We think it's self-evident, there are net zero targets and all of it, but it's not as, as straightforward. So first of all, we'll need to get all of them on board with like it's actually needed, and then demonstration helps a lot in building that credibility, and then I mean, looking at the policy side of things, we really need to get them to adopt specific carbon removal targets. It would be very helpful if we would have more clarity also on carbon removal targets in the, in the, um, uh, in the documents that countries submit under the Paris Agreement. It's so-called nationally determined contributions. Currently, they don't really need to elaborate there too much on removals. It would be helpful to have a lot more clarity there on removals and hopefully also on, on, on more durable removals because once that has been put in place, there's also more appetite to going into how we're going to make it happen. Great. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much. And thank you for indulging me on the question on public acceptance. As I said before, I think policy is really important, but if we don't find a way to tell this story and get this narrative out around the benefits of carbon removal and having communities actually want to see these projects uh, uh, built, um, you know, they won't go very far. And so I think it's important as those of us who think about policy to also be thinking about uh, this, this public acceptance piece and community engagement. Um, we have a few more minutes, I think, for uh, some, some questions. So uh, I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much. Well, let maybe if we can start with questions in the room. If you have a question for our panel today, please do raise your hand. We have one question here and then again behind. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Axel Michaelova, Perspectives, University of Zurich. So, Eve, you said, well, 6.4 is so slow, but um, so countries would probably go into 6.2. The challenge I see with 6.2 is, of course, that if there's a race to the bottom in 6.2 approaches, it might contaminate the compliance markets. So, how would you see now the possibility that the community as a whole tries to bring really high quality methodological approaches into 6.4 that they then spill over into 6.2 because otherwise we really run the risk that we'll again destroy the compliance market as we did it under this clean development mechanism. Thanks. Okay. 
So that's an excellent question, Axel. Thank you. I actually see that both mechanisms will end up informing each other because what will happen now in the next years under the 6.2, this more flexible mechanism, I'm sure that there are going to be methodologies used there that will then feed into the work of 6.4 and maybe in some shape or form be adopted there as well. But it's important for the stakeholders to be active to avoid any, any kind of uh, race to the bottom because it is tricky when you have something as flexible as the 6.2 mechanism where we don't have the specific safeguards and it's very um, appealing to go for because it's so much easier to use than the 6.4 mechanism, which is, I mean, even still being uh, built. So I, I think we should just all, yeah, keep paying attention to it and keep feeding into it. And hopefully we will end up with some great methodologies under 6.4. I think I heard in the last supervisory board meeting it being said that, well, 6.4 mechanism is aiming to do things that have really never been done for removals, even in the voluntary market, that they want to look at all the difficult question and questions and like, kind of lift things to a new level and, and give like, really, really high quality material for, for this market. I mean, if that were to work out, that would be great. And if that would then be taken on as the expected standard also for the 6.2, that would be great. But I am not sure that we will actually end up there. We can just do our best to try. But let's be clear, too. In the list of things that we're worried about for the success of this field, that is not top of mind. I think the, the key thing right now is that we need to go build projects around the world. I might have said that before. <laughs> this does not affect that. And what we need to do is figure out how to marshal the support and focus of this community to get governments around the world to put the resources to building projects. And that is not a question of Article 6.2 versus 6.4. Mm -hmm. it, it may be in the future, but right now, that's where we need to keep our, our eye on the ball. I think Colin just, wanted to add. Just to jump in on that about timing, you know, we know how long it takes to develop policy measures. We're here in Switzerland, and Switzerland is a trailblazer, as we've heard. But when back when they were linking the Swiss emissions trading system with the European Union emissions trading system, it took nearly 10 years. So, you know, is it too soon? Is it too slow? Is it too fast? Is it too cold? We call that a Goldilocks moment. <laughs> we just know that we need to take action now and we need to start these discussions around all the policy options as well as all the demonstration projects that need to happen. Oh, yeah. Never do yeah. It. yeah, maybe quickly to react because it's always good to have some more like emotion in the, in the panel discussion. <laughs> It is completely fair to say that we need, we really need projects and that's what removal reason re needs right now. But then like in the session where we're discussing the policy frameworks, it is very topical to discuss the, the most important international policy framework that we have that's being built and that's under the Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. So I guess we'll need to go at everything. Those who build projects are building projects, policy experts are working on the policy tools and we just need to make it happen. I think a wise woman once said, we need more, and yes, absolutely, yeah. we need more across all of it. What I worry about is that we are skating not to where the puck is going, but where the puck is going after that, and that there's nobody where the puck is going. And so it never gets there unless we actually advance the projects. And so I think figuring out how to shift the conversation to not be only on the Article 6 front and to know that that's a decade-long process and we need people working on it but that we also need a lot of people working on a whole bunch of other things is the really challenging part and shifting the conversation. So what we are doing now is not sufficient. It's necessary, but we need to understand that we need to do more. And I think that's, that's a real key. I love a good hockey reference. <laughs> exactly. No, 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 please. Thank you very much For indeed. Our, uh, our next question. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the panel. Uh, brilliant. I wish we had all day to talk about policy. Um, uh, my question was back to the public acceptance point and something that we're experimenting with. And by the way, I'm Rob Niven with Carbon Cure. We mineralize CO2 in concrete. Um, is is have, have you uh, have you thought and considered like direct investment uh, into local communities from the proceeds of these CDR projects, and have that have that investment co-developed? with communities, so that's most impactful. And it, you know, 
really putting your money where your mouth is and or where your feet is are to drive these projects and drive more public acceptance. Yeah, I can answer from the US perspective and specifically at DOE, we are requiring everyone that applies for our funding to have a community benefit plan in place. And that community benefit plan talks about workforce, it talks about economic impacts. It's a multifaceted uh, component of our application. And that's new for DOE. And so one of the things that we are trying not to do is over-prescribe that and say that every community needs to have a checklist because community engagement is not a checklist, unfortunately. And so I think the key for us is to enable those conversations to happen between project developers and the local community. And that sounds like a great idea, but we need to hear from the communities what they want and what the type of direct investment that they need most actually is. And so it's difficult for us to prescribe a specific set of investments simply because the needs are so heterogeneous. But yes, that, that is where we want to go, and we want to encourage as much of that reinvestment as, as we can. What about from a European perspective? From a European perspective? Well, we're not, we're not project developers, we're a carbon crediting program, but what we hear is it's very important about that license to operate, but also with the local community. And without doing that, you can't progress projects. So first, it's fundamental importance, but that's for our suppliers to decide how they do it. It sounds we've got some great examples from the audience. So thank you for sharing. I've got a couple of questions here um, from our audience online. Um, I'm not quite sure where to start. Maybe, um, Noah, with you, is the DOE involved in some ways in developing similar policy frameworks in other parts of the world? No. <laughs> we're, we're, and I guess from that answer, there's the, no plan for that. The US DOE. No, I, I, so I would say where we engage is through um, primarily multilateral forums like the Mission Innovation Platform, the CDR Launchpad is a great place where we can exchange policy ideas, but the bulk of our work is fundamentally US focused and US based. And so we collaborate with our, our State Department and, and really try to make sure that we can provide that technical assistance to others, but are not sort of formally engaged in creating policy elsewhere. Okay, um, there's a lot of questions about how the voluntary market compares with other markets, for example, the compliance markets. How do you see long-term evolution of each of these markets? How do they compare in, in, in your vision? Yeah. I can Please maybe have, it, have a start at this. Um, so for a while, there was, I think, this vision that eventually the voluntary markets will kind of integrate into compliance markets, and, and that's going to be just the karma markets. But given that, in reality, we don't have all jurisdictions in the world that have a compliance market, so it's an obvious situation that we will always have voluntary markets that do play a role. And uh, as they are, this very nimble and flexible space for, and also a testing ground for, for new things, and we, the innovation will keep happening, right? There are always going to be new solutions that are not part of compliance markets. So for that, voluntary market will keep having a role. But it, it is very small right now, and even if it grows rapidly, it's going to be very small, I think, always compared to compliance markets, and things, unless something changes very fundamentally. Thank you very much. Are there any questions, last questions in the audience? Yes, we have one here. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. My name is Nick Beglinger. I'm the Clean Tech 21 Foundation. I wanted to ask about public acceptance. Don't you think that a price on emitting carbon would help public acceptance in terms of financing, investing, and capturing it on the other side? So in other words, I think the general public has a gut feeling that it's cheaper not to emit in the first place than to grab it back out of the air. And doesn't there need to be a link there to put a price on emitting and then to get credibility on capturing it back? Would it help? Yeah. Of course. <laughs> Do we need it? No. And I think we're not going to get it in the US in the near term. And so from where we sit, it's a, we have the, the best available policy framework that we're going to get. And it's pretty good right now. So we're going to make the most of it, of course, in the future broader carbon pricing could help, but is it necessary now? No. Yeah. 
And I think what we've seen with other renewable energy technologies in the United States is that actually building an industry through research and development and demonstration early incentives is that we're able to build an industry that then creates winners, creates people who are employed by this industry, um, and that creates a really powerful political story that actually creates a positive reinforcing cycle, more so than I think a kind of like regulation um, or like compliance market approach first. So they reinforce each other. Helen. And, and this speaks to the, the regional difference that we have. So, you know, in the EU, we have a, a price on, on carbon emissions. And um, what's really exciting, and as a policy person, this is probably one of the most exciting things that can happen is under the revised version of the EU emissions trading system, Article 30, Paragraph 5A, um, has a requirement for the European Commission to look at the role of negative emissions under the compliance markets. We're policy neutral. Uh, in Pure Earth, what we want to do is have a discussion about where will this ultimately fit, fitting with whatever is said around, ultimately, this is about compliance markets. Thank you very much. I hope that answered your question. And I think we've run out of time, so thank you all very much indeed. Please take a seat. Thank you. Thank you.